In this video, we're going to talk about domain and range of inverse functions. If you flip through textbooks, you'll see that a lot of these values are defined by convention. And there's nothing wrong in defining things by convention, but in this video, I'll share some of my observations on these values, why I think that these values make sense. Let's get started. Now, while looking at these values, I realized that I would have reached the same conclusion if I used only three principles. Let me share those principles. The first one is because we want functions, we're looking for unique output for every input. Here's an example. If we talk about sine function, the domain is the set of all real numbers. The range is minus one to one. You put in any angle and you get something as an output in this set minus one to one. Now, if you flip this, if we ask the same question for sine inverse, this range for sine becomes the domain for sine inverse. You can only input values from minus one to one. So this domain makes sense. But what about the range? What output will you get from sine inverse? If we put the range as R, the set of all real numbers, we will get huge overlap. There are infinite angles that give the same output. This means we'll get infinite outputs for the same input. That's something that we don't want. We want a unique output for every input. So if you look at the domain, we have positive values and negative values. Now by convention, we have defined the range as minus pi by two to pi by two. Let's pause for a while and think about why this range makes sense. The domain is the set of all values from minus one to one. We have positive values and negative values. For all positive values, the range can be the quadrant one. That's from zero to pi by two. And for all negative values, the range is minus pi by two to zero, the fourth quadrant. And together, these two quadrants cover the entire domain without any overlap, which means we have satisfied this first principle, unique output for every input. But then the question is, why these two quadrants? Why this region? Why not this region? Pi by two to three pi by two. The second quadrant and the third quadrant. Sine is positive in the second one and negative in the third one. So these two should also work. Or what about this one? First quadrant, zero to pi by two, and the fourth quadrant, but this time the fourth quadrant is not from minus pi by two to zero, but from three pi by two to two. Why do we pick this set over these sets? Pause the video, think about it. All right, let me share what I think. I think we pick this set over this one because quadrant one is amazing. In this set, the range for the positive values of sine is the second quadrant. But in this set, the range is the first quadrant. Now this only works for sine, but this will work for all trigonometric ratios. So this will help us stay consistent. If we take the range for all positive values as quadrant one, this will help us not only for sine, but for all trigonometric ratios. And the reason why I pick this set over this second set is because breaks are bad. This is first and fourth quadrant without breaks. We take values from minus pi by two to pi by two, a smooth continuous set. Whereas this one also has first quadrant and fourth one, but with a break in between. We're missing the second and third quadrant, and then we are jumping back to fourth. So why would you pick the same set with breaks when you can pick it without them? And if I were to put this in fancy words, I would say that the second principle is that we like to stay consistent. And the third one is that we like to stay continuous. And because not all functions are continuous, so I'll put a bracket here as much as possible. Now taking these three principles into account, we can define the domain and range for all inverse functions. Here's an example. Let's take the cost function. The domain is the set of all real values and the range is minus one to one. And if you flip this, if we talk about cost inverse, the domain becomes minus one to one, but what's the range? If we take two quadrants, one positive and one negative, we can take the first quadrant as the range for all positive values. In this way, we are staying consistent with the sine inverse function. And what about the negative values? Well, if you want to stay continuous, we can either pick the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant. We can't pick the fourth quadrant because cos is positive. So we'll pick the second one and the range becomes zero to pi. Think about it. This range has a unique output for every input, is consistent with the sine inverse function and gives us a continuous set for the range of cos inverse. Now the entire range does not match, but at least the first quadrant matches. Here's another example, cosec function. Let's talk about the domain and range for cosec and cosec inverse. The domain is set of all real numbers minus wherever cosec is not defined. That's when the denominator is zero, which is sine x. So sine is zero for all multiples of pi, which means the domain is r minus n pi. All right, so this function cosec is itself discontinuous. What about range? Range is all values minus 
minus 1 to 1. Again, because this is the reciprocal of sine, it will give all values outside minus 1 and 1. Now, if you flip this, what's the domain for cosec inverse? That's going to be the range for cosec. So the domain is r minus minus 1 to 1. But what's the range? Which quadrant should we pick for the range for cosec inverse? Again, if you want to stay consistent, we'll take the first quadrant for positive values. And because this is the inverse for sine, this is also negative in the fourth quadrant. So let's take first and fourth quadrant, just like we have for sine as the range for cosec inverse. We have to exclude one value, which is zero. This is where cosec is not defined. So we'll not get an output for cosec inverse. This range minus pi by two to pi by two minus zero is almost same as sine inverse. Look at these two. We have the exact same range except this value where cosec inverse is not defined. Now let's apply these principles to get the domain and range for all six functions. We have this unit circle and we have four quadrants. Sine is positive in the second one. Cos is positive in the fourth one. Tan is positive in the third one. And all of them are positive in the first quadrant. This is what we did for sine. The range for sine theta is minus one to one. We broke this range into two parts, positive and negative. And then we checked which quadrants work for each. For positive, we picked the first quadrant. And for negative, we picked its neighbor quadrant, the fourth quadrant. Now this gave us the range for sine inverse function. Let's write that down. The domain for sine inverse is minus one to one. And the range becomes these two quadrants. That's minus pi by two to pi by two. We did the same thing for cos. For positive values, we picked Q1. And for negative values, because we couldn't pick Q4, cos is also positive here, we picked Q2. So the range for cos is these two quadrants, Q1 and Q2. Let's write that down. Domain is the same, minus one to one, and the range is zero to pi. What about tan? Now pause the video, think about which two quadrants work for tan inverse. All right, let's do this together. We can get all positive values from the first quadrant, but for negative values, we have two options. We can either pick the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant. Which one should we pick? Well, tan is sine by cos and denominator becomes zero, cos becomes zero at pi by two. That's not the case here. That's not the case at zero. Cos of zero is one. So if we take these two quadrants, we'll have a continuous set. So instead of Q2, we prefer Q4. So that's what we prefer for tan. Tan inverse has a domain R, the set of all real numbers. The range for all positive values in domain is the first quadrant and the range for all negative values is this fourth quadrant. The range becomes minus pi by two to pi by two. The difference between sine inverse and tan inverse is that for sine inverse, you can include these two endpoints, minus pi by two and pi by two, but for tan inverse, you can't. Sine pi by two is one, which you can input in sine inverse. Sine pi by two is infinity, which you can't input in tan inverse. So that's why we have open brackets here. Similarly for cot, the first quadrant will give us the positive values, but what about the negative values? Which quadrant should we pick? Now cot is cos by sine, and we want to be careful. We don't want sine to be zero. Sine is zero here at x equal to zero. So we'll take these two quadrants because we want continuity. So we'll take Q2. So cot sits here. The range for cot is these two quadrants, the first one and the second one. Cot inverse has domain R, but range as zero to pi. Again, we don't include zero and pi in the range of cot inverse because that's where cot is not defined. What about cosec? Cosec is the reciprocal of sine. So it's positive where sine is positive and it's negative where sine is negative. So let's copy what we have for sine and paste it for cosec. So Q1 for positive and Q4 for negative. So these two quadrants work for sine. These two quadrants also work for cosec. So cosec inverse has domain R minus minus one to one and range as minus pi by two to pi by two. We're excluding the values where it's not defined. So we're excluding zero. So we do see a discontinuity here for cosec inverse. What about sec? Sec will copy cos. It's positive where cos is positive and it's negative where cos is negative. So Q1 for positive and Q2 for negative. Sec sits here. Sec inverse has domain R minus minus one to one and the range as zero to pi, excluding this value that's pi by two. So if we summarize this set, the domain for all inverse functions is the range of all trigonometric functions. And the range for these inverse functions are two quadrants. For all positive values, we have the range as Q1, the first quadrant. And for negative values, we have a neighboring quadrant, 
either Q2 or Q4, depending on which quadrant gives us the negative value while ensuring that we have a continuous set. Now that we have the domain and range for inverse functions, let's also look at their graphs. Sine inverse X has this graph. The domain is minus one to one. You can input values from minus one to one and the range is minus pi by two to pi by two. This graph is the mirror image of sine X in this line Y equals to X, this blue line Y equals to X. And you can also see the quadrants at play. This is the first quadrant from zero to pi by two. And this is the fourth quadrant minus pi by two to zero. Another function is cos inverse X. So this is the graph for cos inverse. The domain is minus one to one and the range is zero to pi. You can see that X equals to minus one gives pi because cos of pi is minus one and X equals to one gives zero because cos of zero is one. So this is the graph for cos inverse X. This is the first quadrant zero to pi by two. And this is the second quadrant pi by two to pi. Another graph is tan inverse X. This is the smooth graph for tan inverse X is the mirror image of tan X in the line Y equals to X. The domain, as you can see from the graph is the set of all real values, but the range is only from minus pi by two to pi by two. This is the range. It never hits pi by two or minus pi by two. These are asymptotes. This is quadrant one and this is quadrant four. Another smooth graph is of cot inverse X. The domain is again set of all real values, but the range here is zero to pi. This graph also sits above X axis. This is quadrant one, zero to pi by two. And this is quadrant two, pi by two to pi. Then we have two discontinuous functions, cosec inverse X and sec inverse. This is the graph for cosec inverse X. The domain is a set of all real values except minus one to one. So the domain is R minus minus one to one. And the range is all values from minus pi by two to pi by two, except zero. It takes all values from minus pi by two to zero here and all values from zero to pi by two here. This is quadrant one. This is quadrant four. This function will never give zero as an output. And finally, we have sec inverse X. This is also a discontinuous function. The domain is R minus minus one to one. And the range is zero to pi, except this value, which is pi by two. This is first quadrant and this is the second quadrant. So these were the graphs and this is the table for the domain and range for inverse functions. I personally use this visual when I have to remember which quadrants to pick. Sine is positive here in the white one and negative here in the green one. So sine takes these two, cos takes these two, tan takes these two and cot takes these two and then cosec is where sine is and sec is where cos is.